So the magic is not just about what you're preparing, but it's about how you present it. Welcome to the Lush Life Podcast. I'm your drinking companion, Susan Schwartz, and I bring you the how-to guide for living life one cocktail at a time. Thanks to my mother's love of martinis, the first words I spoke were shaken, not stirred, and I've been obsessed by cocktails ever since. Together, we'll learn from bartenders, brand ambassadors, distillers, and others why certain drinks are popular in certain cultures, how to make the perfect old-fashioned, when to shake and when to stir, and so much more. Hear that sound? It's time to cozy up to the bar and let the fun begin. Welcome back. I hope you had a great August. To begin the autumn season, I'm here with a cocktail whose ingredients include hard work and determination mixed with a centuries-old Italian spirit reborn, all served up by today's guest, Luca Mizzaglia. But before all that, I have some really exciting news. Lush Life Podcast and LushLifeManual.com have been nominated for a Sever Magazine Blog Award in the Best Drinks Blog category. I thank all of you who nominated me. There is both an editorial award and a popular award, so head to alushlifemanual.com and vote as many times as you wish. Now, I know I promised you Season 3, but technically this is still Season 2 until everything I have planned for the new season is ready to go, and it's not. At least, not right now. It's all semantics anyway, season two, season three. It's still Lush Life and still the how-to guide for living life one cocktail at a time. Which brings me back to our guest, Luca Mizzaglia, the brand ambassador of Italicus, Rosolio di Bergamotto. I almost said it was a new spirit which has taken the world by storm, but Italian grandmothers have been brewing it up in their homes for centuries. The flavor is divine. But enough chat from me. Let's hear it all from Luca. I I, I come from Italy, from a little city, which is near to Milan, which is called Vimercangeles. No, I'm joking. It's called Vimercate. (laughs) But all of us, we call it Vimercangeles, you know. Why? Because because we have that kind of sense of LA, Los Angeles. For a small town? Yes. So we call it when we go back. Where are you going back? We're going back to... To be Mercangeles, you know. <laughs> oh, I love that. Now, how many people who who've act who live there have actually been to Los Angeles? I mean, how small <laughs> well, a town the, is uh, it? The, the percentage I can tell you is uh, equal to one to a million or something like that. That is the proportion you can get. <laughs> but that's uh, how we become. So that's how I call it. Uh, For Cangeles. Vimer Cangeles. Oh, Vimer Cangeles. Vimer Cangeles. Yeah. All right, that's what we'll call it from now on. Perfect. That's it. That's how everyone's call it in the city. <laughs> <laughs> they take us like they think that we are crazy. Sorry. Uh, but yes, I come from there, and I spend uh, about twenty years of my life, nineteen years of my life, over to uh, in Italy, where I had a lot of fun. <laughs> it's an incredible city. Did you study anything? Uh, yes, I tried. You know, I wasn't the best. You know, my mom is a teacher, and because of that, I need to, you know, I need to put myself in a different position, so make troubles and uh, go to bars. But was she a and teacher like at your school? Uh, no, it was a different school. She didn't want to be. Uh, she chose to not be. What did she teach? Uh, religion. Oh boy! <laughs> well, yes, exactly. So you were a bad boy just yeah. because you taught religion, right? You got it. You got it right. Uh, is it true? <laughs> so I was a bad boy. No, I wasn't. Uh, but yes, I've been studying, and I always had a massive passion for bars and cocktails. So, literally, when I was fourteen, fifteen, I decided to start to work in in restaurant. Why do you think you had this passion for bars? I, the reason why is my grandfather. My grandfather used to have a bar and I used to be, uh, I was small and uh, I used to running around into the bar and uh, I don't remember much, but I remember that I was around it by people, you know, 
Every time he was uh, super happy, probably was, was it, thinking of what it. What kind of bar was it? Like it was a, a cappuccino and all that, pl- or just an evening bar? It was, it was a, a we, a we call it, a, we call it trattoria style bar. Okay. So you will have some food alongside with your glass of uh, white wine, bianchino, mm-hmm. or cicchetti, a little olives, nuts, whatever it was there. So this was a bar for, let's say, old people, you know, uh, go there, have some food, but have some drinks. Uh, he was importing wine. So he had a big passion. I think in the family, I'm the only one that is really attached to the feeling that my grandfather left. So I had this passion, decided to work in a restaurant. I start parking cars. That is uh, hilarious because it was really hot. I start in July, super hot. And uh, I was parking cars of rich people because I was working uh, in a place which had a swimming pool, restaurant. It was a luxury bar. Then after a couple of weeks working there, they said, we need someone in the kitchen. I said, well, I prefer to go to the kitchen to stay under the sun. So and I started also, to work as a kitchen port. I guess because you're 14 and 15, you couldn't work in a bar? Uh, right well, away? yes, I couldn't. I couldn't play with, with alcohol mm. until the age of, I think, 16. Mm. But I think that it was not the case in, the, in that situation. I tried, to, <laughs> I tried to push forward the door and say, I want to move out from, from the parking. I want to get inside. All right, so you're in the kitchen now. Yeah, now I'm in the kitchen, you know, next to the chef. I was always a, a fascinating. I grew up with my grandmother and my mother cooking. Uh, when I say my family, my grandmother, my mother are the best chef, it's real. Mm. Well, of course they are. They are really, 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 really good. And uh, I always have this passion of doing something for other people, you know, like cooking or making drinks now. But, uh, you know, everything it starts, you know, I, it's sparking myself, being in the kitchen. I felt like, please. Also, if I was washing the pots, but I was stealing whatever the chef was doing to wait for the moment. And then certain point... Uh, the kitchen porter, the chef, he said, I need someone to help me out. Can you do that? I will show you the way. And for me, it was like, yes, <laughs> I want to do that. So I started to help the chefs to do things, preparation and everything else. So we had another kitchen porter. And uh, from there, the, the, the way, you know, to moving from the, from the restaurant, so from the back of the restaurant mm-hmm. to the bar, it started to take, you know, action. So I was speaking with, uh, with, with the bar manager at the time and I want to learn about this, about that. So then the next step, it was working behind the bar. So I've been working behind the bar in, in Italy making drinks. All right. And so didn't the, the chef miss you? Didn't he say, why are you taking the you chef, my guy? The chef, he was uh, happy. <laughs> <laughs> I say with the H pronounced, as an Italian would say. <laughs> uh, it, it was happy in a way uh, because he, at a certain point he can't handle me anymore because I was making too many questions. It was like, we are here to cook fish and meat, good, that's it. And I was making it, why we don't do that? Why that? All my research, all the things, it was like, can you leave this place? <laughs> I, no, you are maybe annoying. the bar can handle you. Are you are annoying, you are annoying. You know, I was like, okay, fine, fine. <laughs> so when you first got to the bar, you know, your first day, did you think, this is it? I feel this, this is where oh, I And it was first been. day, it's like, it's been a good feeling. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's been... Uh, Talking to people for me has been always natural. In the kitchen, I was speaking with the chef and I was proving myself, showing to do something. You know, I was trying to cook. I was doing my best. But when I jumped into the bar, I said, I can do my best, doing the best drink with the best flavors. You know, so you, you, you have your part, but at the same time, I can talk to people. So the magic is not just about what you're preparing, but it's about how you present it. Sometimes in the kitchen, you have a great chef. He's making the most beautiful food. And who he comes to the bar, who he comes to the restaurant, or who works in the restaurant, mm-hmm. he drops you the plate like it's not so special. So that is a transition that you miss it. So I felt myself like I can do both in one. And this is the way how I want to go. So after a while, I, after a while, after a season, uh, I start university. I try to study economics after three months or four months. No exam. I didn't study. I did all the party could be possibly imagined. <laughs> you were the one to know in college, I, right? I, I knew everyone. You know I Luca. knew everyone. I knew everyone. We'll tell you where the good parties are. I was the, the master. And uh, I talked to my dad and I said, you know what? I think I'm wasting my time. And uh, for my mom, it was a shock. You know, like you need to do university. Mm-hmm. How are you going to get a degree? It was 2008. I said, like, I can start to feel there is a crisis. There is nothing interesting that I can study. What I'm studying is not going to take me anywhere. That's my thought. And I said, you know what, Dad? I want to live. And I would like to, to follow my passion, which is about bars, restaurants. So be involved to, to the drinking industry. 
My, but my dad looked at me, and two days after, he bought me a ticket. He said, this is your ticket. Next week, you go. I was like, Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like okay. <laughs> okay, it seems to be quite fast, the transition. So, yeah, yeah, don't lose your time. Just get your stuff and go. We are, we are tired of seeing you already around, doing nothing. You've been spending three, four months not doing much. Get your stuff and go. My mom crying. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, but in the end, he helped me to, to push at that push. He gave me more like, okay, you say like that. Mm-hmm. Then I'm going to take it and I will show you. I will not come back if I will not do what my intentions are. So then from there, I moved to, to England. Literally, did he give you like literally a ticket? Literally, he, he showed me. I just bought your ticket. This is it. And, and the ticket and was <laughs> to London? It was to London, yes. How did he know that you wanted to go to London? The reason why is because the three months that I spent in the university, I was coming to London quite often. But when I say quite often, I came like probably four times, five times uh, in, the, in three, four months. So what happened is I said to him, like, you know, I can see that is interesting. It will be a place where I want to live. I see the culture. I was talking through him and say that. And uh, I was discussing uh, when I arrived home. I said, university, I'm not doing well. Maybe maybe I should consider to move to England okay. and go to London. So then he heard my words. <laughs> Two days after he came with the ticket and I was like, okay. Next week you go. That's and when it. you were visiting London, did you check out all the bars here? I mean, what I did, I had a friend of mine, uh, which uh, he was involved into a bar, which this bar I think doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, another one, which is one of his best friends too. So I was moving and go around with them. So we were going clubs, we were going bars, and I start to look at the bars in a different way. You know, like the perception that you have in Italy is one thing. You know, Negroni, uh, you know, Sbagliato, Spritz. It's all in the same glass. There is not much love, but, you know, you just drink it, a big jug, you know. Here, I could start to see the definition of what it is, like the details, you know, the glassware, the eyes, the way how the bartender were moving around. Then, you know, I used to go to uh, a place, um, what's it called? In Notting, Notting Hill Gate. I can't remember right now the name. Ugh. Trailer Happiness? No, it doesn't exist anymore. I can't remember the name. I used to go there where Agostino Perrone used to work. Uh, Montgomery Place. So I used to go to the Montgomery Place and see a different world of cocktail. And I used to come, see these things. And uh, from there, you know, the passion started to be even more. And I said, maybe I should follow my passion. And that's it. Not do what the schedule mm-hmm. or because your mom or your dad tells you you should do this because uh, what uh, this is not my it's not their plan it's my plan you know and did you feel that you had enough kind of in your bag to go to london and be able to get a job or did you just wing it i i said to myself it's like before i start <laughs> before i will make it so don't waste your time. Just go and do something. You know, like, first of all, I had to learn English because I didn't know how to speak the language. I, in Italy, I have to say that I never spent much time of learn, you know, what English is about. Still now I have trouble and issue when I speak or when I send emails, you know, but at least I'm funny so <laughs> and charming. So the two things, they got <laughs> equalized, you know, but uh, uh, yeah, so I had to learn the language first. And uh, so I, I made up a plan. I, I sit down and said, okay, now I'm leaving. This shit gets serious. <laughs> so let's, let's make a, a real plan of what to do. What's this? What is next? And how I need to move forward. So I make my, my own plan and I kept it there. Every birthday, I will open the plan and see what I achieved. So to check and check. I still do it. Uh, still it, doing it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so you got to London. Where did you look for your first job? Uh, I had a job on day two. I soon arrived. Well, there's so many Italians here. But right? the best part, I've been fired on day three. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best story I can tell because right to London, I had uh, an incredible uh, company of people around me. Like, I arrived here, I have my best friend that he had the house. So he said, don't worry, you don't need to pay the rent. Me and you, we get in this, this flat and we sub rent it to other people and we get the money out of it. So I said, perfect. I said, how much you need? It's a thousand pounds per head. And then we do this. I said, perfect. So as soon as I arrived on day one, a thousand pounds to him. I, I had like probably a thousand, a thousand five hundred on my mm. bank account. I went out for one night or two nights and I spent another five hundred. <laughs> so I look at my bank account and I'm like, okay, I have five hundred. Okay. <laughs> now the thing is get tough. You know, now I need to, I need to move faster. And uh, he said to me, okay, I got a friend. That friend were a 
that, that I was spending some time back in time when I used to visit London. And he said to me, oh, don't worry, there is my girlfriend uh, that uh, is they're looking for a kitchen porter. Can you do that? I said, anything is fine. Okay, fine, fine, fine. He called her up and said like, oh, there is a friend. Oh, yeah, don't worry. So I organized, she called me back, said, oh, don't worry, Luca, tomorrow morning, straight away, he didn't like that. Uh, yes, tomorrow morning, uh, 6.45, you come into the restaurant, I give you the dress, you pop down, and you're going to work straight away on the same day. I was like, wow, you know, like, so fast. I arrived there, do my shift, introduce myself. I found out in this place it was called Cafe Concerto. I don't know if you ever heard about it. So I arrived into that place. Uh I go downstairs, work in the kitchen all day long, without speaking, without food, without nothing. Just drinking water, washing dishes all day, all day, all day, all day, all day. day. At a certain point I see uh, the general manager or whoever was in charge, a guy with with a shirt, he come to me and he started to shout at me something. I was like, oh, I look at him and I was like, what does he say? You know, I have oh, no idea what he's about to say. I say, you uh, may, yes, yes. And he was like, no, 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 no. I was like, I don't know. I was like, okay, fine. I said, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, it was a word, you know, yeah. tomorrow, you know, same time. Yeah, no, no. I didn't understand anything. Well, I arrived home go to sleep because it was already late day after i go back to work the same person with the shirt it do me like that i was like what the hell is going on why does he want allowed me to come in <laughs> what happened is it was like no you're not here in the end they tried to understand he didn't want me so i called my friend i said something happened i arrived here and he just kicked me out of the restaurant he said i didn't tell you i forgot to tell you you know sylvia which is uh, uh-huh. uh his girlfriend he had a big fight with the general manager. He told him to f*** off. So has he introduced like her cousin, you know? So you lost the job. And I was like, oh my God. I mean, like, are you serious about it? I was like, okay, yes, okay, fine. fine. So because of that little thing, <laughs> this is what happened. So then I was like, okay, now I need, to, I, need to, I need to find a job because, you know, they didn't pay me one day. I don't have money. And... You know, more I spend, less money I will have. And I will never call my family to get some money. Never, ever, ever. So then what happened is I started to look up for a job. I print out an interview. Uh, interview, sorry. I print out a, a CV with all my experiences. And I went around to look up for a job with a suit. So I was like, okay, I need to be well-dressed. That also, if they don't understand what I'm saying, at least I look good. And may I have a chance to get a job. So I start to walk around everywhere, all over London, like with a bunch of 50 CVs, like, like that, with a shirt, suit, a super nice tie, you know, super, super, super early. When people were speaking to me, I could not understand anything. I could not understand what they were saying, so I had to get them to write it down. So walk, 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 at a certain point I arrived to Covent Garden, and uh, I met this woman, and... Uh, I said to her, I'm looking for a job. I prepared this sentence. I repeated it 100 times to remember it because I didn't know what to say afterwards. It told that I'm looking for a job because I was going around to say, I'm searching for a job. You know, that's what I was doing. <laughs> so then found this place, which is uh, it's called Patisserie Valerie. Oh yeah, of course. Because I said, I need to start from somewhere. And uh, she looked at me. She said, I speak a bit of Italian, so I can speak to you. So tomorrow, do, do, yeah. domani, you come here, yeah? You be qua. I was like, okay, perfect. Said, uh, yeah, come with a shirt, with, oh, sorry, with a t-shirt, with the black trousers. I was like, perfect, perfect. I come in and they give me a job straight away. And I was the kitchen porter, coffee boy. That's how I started my career in London. And then, and then it was a long year, a really, really, really long year, really long you year. You did that for a year? For a year. And after three I, weeks. Yeah, sorry, did you no find problem. yourself learning English? Quite yes. quickly, so because of that, what happened is yes, what happened is that the first two weeks that I was there, I tried to to get the words around. I was going home; it was all Italian, so I was speaking mm-hmm. Italian, and there it was all English. So I was like, okay, fine, I'm practicing as much as possible. So I I tried, and uh, she's been so kind. She said, why you don't do an English course? There is a school really close. Third week, I go to see a school which is the Westminster College in Soho. So I go there and apply for a course, super intense, where I do 9 to 12 for 5 days a week and 1 to 10 uh, for 6 days a week at work. So for one year, 
the only thing I've been doing it was studying English and working. So and this is up to like after one week I was in London roughly. So I was shocked, you know, I was like, okay, whoa, this is going to be intense. But I said, it's better to do it now than do it in 10 years time or not do it at all. So I said, let's do it now. So for one year, I've been like literally head down, studying, working, studying, working. I was, I will be at home on Sunday, just looking at the ceiling for feeling how tired I was. That's what it, what, what it was, everything. And uh, when I left, uh, London, I said to my mom, I will never come back unless I will leave this job and I will get myself to a different stage and learn something. So she said to me, no, you should come and see me. So I didn't want anyone to mm-hmm. see me. Not as a kitchen porter, but I said like, you know, it's a personal, you right. know, determination that you need to apply to yourself to make things happen. So, and uh, so I've been doing that for a year. I finished the school. Uh, after a year, I said, okay, now I can speak a bit of English and I can talk to guests and I understand people, so I can move to the next stage. So then I moved from there to another bar, uh, which is called the uh, Soho Bar, which is just at the corner of Soho, because they were looking for a bar back. Because I said, I'm not here to be a kitchen porter, I'm not here to be a waiter or a restaurant manager, it's not the point. My point is to here to be the best bartender that you know I want to be and be in the bar industry. So I said, I need to start from somewhere. So looking around, I applied for a uh, lab bar, but there was no chances. I was like, okay, lab it was for me the place where I wanted to work. That's the reason why I was in London, okay? But uh, I would like to open a bracket and close it afterwards. The old feeling that I had to be in London, yeah? When I start to think about it, to moving on, I wrote an article about Giorgio Locatelli, which was on GQ Italia. And he described his experience, which he was from you know, the, the Como Lake or, you know, the area where he come from, moving from there over to London to cook and stuff. And I was like, everything is possible, you know, like it does not matter. You know, there is no limit to whatever is your passion, your feeling. So that it was something that in my mind, it pushed me as well forward to make this move, you know, mm-hmm. in the beginning. So now closing bracket, <laughs> going back to the story. <laughs> but this it was a part that, you know, is important because this belongs to what I am now, you know. And uh, so when I was at uh, Soho, Soho uh, Bar, they gave me an opportunity to work as a barbec. The lab didn't want me because I said, I want to work in lab. This was my main achievement. I want, to, I want to work in lab. That's it. So then I was in, uh, in the bar as a, as a barbec. I've been working for three months as a barbec, four months. And then they started to teach me a bit of, you know, how to make simple drinks. Like <clears throat> how they were making it in England because... In Italy, it's completely different culture. Everything is different. So then they showed me a little bit the way. People were into it in flair still. I was like, it's not my kind. My kind is about the flavor. I was coming, you know, I like when something tastes good and it's present well, you know, like like a, a nice car, smart and elegant, but it's fast as well, you know. That is the kind of thing uh, that I had in mind. So been working there, been promoted as a bartender. Then they made me head bartender, if I don't remember wrong, something like that. And then at a certain point, I had a friend that he was working in lab and he said, oh, you know what? There is a position available as a barbec. And I was like, okay, I need to step down to do that. Yes, I will do that. Mm-hmm. That's no matter what it's going to cause me. I'm sure it's the right way because that is going to give me a big platform to, to do whatever I want to do. Then I went to lab and applied for a, for a, for a barbec. They said, but you're a bartender. I said, that's no matter. There's no position available, but you can wait. No, it's fine. I can be, I prefer to be here. To learn from the basics that not to do that so then uh, they took me on board and uh, i had the best days of lab i think one of the the best gap of the coolest moment of uh what it was the the real scene of of uh lab uh it was a bar with four guests it, it was a bartender uh, tavern i will call it you know like you know uh, and it was so much fun, uh, which I spent a couple of years there. Uh, I loved it. I was a barbec, then I became a bartender. Then they noticed that uh, I had really good quality on uh, talking to the guest. This is because going back to, to, to when I was in Italy, you know, like I always play, you know, the role of talking to the guest when the other were thinking about throwing the bottle and things like that. For me, it wasn't not important. For me, it was important the guest, you know. 
So then they noticed and they were like, oh, but yeah, but you should help us a bit on the floor, you know, like, you know, things like that. You can work a bit behind the bar. I liked it, you know, and that to give me a different opportunity. For me, it wasn't a punishment or it wasn't like, for me, it was great. Many bartenders would say, oh, no, I'm a bartender and I stay there. For me, it was great. I could talk to the people that they will not come to the bar, which is was the 80% of it. Mm-hmm. So then, thanks to that, I start to speak with many people from the industry, become friends and knowing many more people that I knew before. And uh, one of those days, a good friend, which he was uh, John Koguru, was the global brand ambassador of, at the time for Sagatiba Cachaca. He came in uh, with a guy, uh, which has become my mentor, which is called uh, Zdenek Kastanek, uh, a Czech Republic guy, super cool, that uh, he was the hottest bartender at the moment. You know, like uh, we're talking about three, four years ago, he's been nominated to the cocktail. He won best bar in the world with the 28 Hong Kong Street. Uh, he's been nominated as best bartender in the world for three, four times. So he's one of those top people that, uh, but he didn't know that. So he introduced it to me and he looked at me and he said like, you're really skilled on, on the floor. You have that kind of sense of uh, commanding a place, you know, like you, you run it. And I said, you know, for me, it's been my passion of life and he said, like, if you're tired of a uh, lab or if you have any plan in your life, just drop me a, a message or an email. I will be happy to show you what is Covadis. And I was like, I heard about Covadis, which is down the road, but never had an opportunity as a members club. So then uh, he gave me his card and I said, OK, cool. I will consider. Why not? Spend quite a lot of time. My girlfriend at the time, which is not the same that I have now, that it will be my wife. But <laughs> uh, she said to me. Say so like you're drinking too much. You're drinking. You don't eat. You're not eating properly. Uh, you don't look good. You know, like you you're not healthy. The lifestyle at Labi was a rock and roll, but in a real mean of rock and roll. You know, like <laughs> go sleep at five, wake up at ten, and go to work at twelve. So it was kind of real, real rock and roll. So I make up my mind and I say, well, you know, I have an opportunity to grow. You know, now I need to think about what is my next step. You know, I can think about this. I can be a lab for what? Other two years, three years. But then what is my main aim? Now, I achieved what I wanted to achieve when I moved to London. You know, it's done. Next. What, yeah. what is the next step? So I spent a couple of years there. And I said, okay, well, I get in touch with this Danik. Let's see how it's provided. It's never been there. I heard about it. It's, it's okay. It's a good place. As soon as I opened through the door, I looked the place and I see the looks all around, which was incredible. Walk up to the stairs. I see this uh, piano and I see a long bar in the end. I look the place and I was like, whoa, this is a different type of thing. You know, everyone dress up with uh, black trousers, white, white shirt, uh, black braces, uh, black tie. You know, I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is wow. So he said to me, he said like, well, you know, I'm looking for, 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 for a bartender. And uh, someone that he also can help on the floor, he can do both, you know, someone that he will be good to add into the team. And I looked the place, I met the owner on the spot. So I was feeling, you know, like, you know, this is the place where I want to be. Left the place, um, step on, <laughs> step on, uh, as soon as I come out, I step on the, oh, sorry to say it, on the shit. <laughs> dog poop. Of a dog. It's good luck. Straight away in, you know, after the interview, I just literally, I was like, what the hell? I look at it. Thank God it was after the interview, not before the interview, right? (laughs) It was just after that. So then after probably a a day, a day and a half, he called me back. He said like, well, we're happy to to advise you for for a try shift. It would be good. It seems to be that the owner likes you, the way how you propose yourself and, you know, myself as well. I was like, okay, cool. So I went over for a try shift, said to me, for us, you are cool. Uh, when you're ready to start. So now I was like, okay, now I need to leave the lab, you know, I need to tell them, you know, like I felt always guilty for no reason uh, when I left a place to go to somewhere else. Um, I have no idea why. Uh, maybe because you feel attached, you think... Well, loyal, I guess loyalty. Think is one of the, yeah. the, the things that you're like, but, you know, the people around you as well, a little bit uh, why you're leaving, you know, like, uh, you know, like everyone needs to move on but I always moved so not not not, not, not never been a issue so then we had a big party at lap which I can't remember much uh, then after that we I no actually after that I moved straight into Kovadis 
So I started as a bartender. So was it everything that you thought it would be when you... It's never everything you think. <laughs> you know, it's never like that. <laughs> it doesn't exist that place. Or if it exists, it's because you make it your own, starting from scratch. Uh, but uh, I realized it was the place where I wanted to be. Because and what I, do you think you learned from that compared to lab? Uh, what I learned from Kovadisi was the elegance, the smartness, the way the bespoke tailor-made service. That's what I learned. The way how to treat the guest from the moment that they're coming through the door. Mm-hmm. That, is the mo- that is the most magical moment for a guest to come through. When I come to your house, when I go to your bar, I open the door, I want to feel it. I don't want to go to the bar and no one is looking at me. Everyone look at their drink. And I'm sorry, you know, you know, can I have a drink, please? No, you don't want that. You want to open the door. How are you? It's really nice to see you again, you know? How are things with you? Yeah. So really, it's the hospitality yeah. of hospitality. That the you host like. Italia. Host, host Italia, I love that. That's, that's what it is, the hostitality. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's how you how just make it Italian. Yes, that's how it is. I'm, I will do seminars in the future <laughs> in regards to that. You will see. Host Italia. <laughs> so... The fact is that that we decide to, uh, I decide to be there and embrace this challenge. I've been lucky. I've been uh, so involved into that. At that time, Zdaniki was applying. It was doing the Bacardi Legacy. Okay, so it was one of the finalists, the three finalists. So it was already in the final. And I was looking at him. I was like, F- yeah. he's literally making it like. A, a, a history, a legacy behind himself. And I said, like, okay, from now on, I want to start to compete as well. So I didn't say anything to him or to nobody. I start to search and research about competition and stuff, and I start to apply. So I start to apply, I start to work concept around, and uh, at a certain point, I had to say, you know, I decided to apply. Ah, so you want to compete as well. But you need to think, he started to give me advice and things, and I was like, okay, you need to help me with this, da, da, da. So it became like, a job on three, you know, like from the morning until the night. I would not sleep to think about the drinks I need to present for the next competition. So I've been doing like, I don't know, probably 10 competition. And uh, I was going presenting myself always like third, second, second, third, fourth, always like on the top three, four. I was like, okay, you know, I don't make it through. One day I went for a competition, which it was the Saronno. And uh, the judge was, I remember I still, it was uh, Ryan Cetiwayan, uh, then it was Simone Caporale, and then it was uh, Simon Difford. So I did this competition. Not and- an easy three judges to impress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially, you know, uh, Simone was a, is a good friend. So mm-hmm. it was a good friend. But at the time we knew each other, but not, you know, so close as, as we are now. So then I do the competition and coming through, there was all the competitors. I do my presentation and I try to stand out from the crowd. You know, like, you know, when you do so many, but you know what to do, what, you know, straight to the point. They call the third and I said, I'm not the third. Uh, oh, I'm the fourth then, not the second. I said, so then I'm the fourth for sure. They called the first and they won the competition for the UK. I was like, I can't believe it. I just made it through, you know, like, and it was about eight months that I was working there. So it was great, and I will go to the global final. So I start to get into the mentality of understanding. Okay, back up. What do you think is the thing that pushed you to become the winner this time? I think what it pushed me is the willing to, to prove that I was a, you know, I was a valid bartender. I was someone in the industry that they want to stand out from being just a bartender. Mm-hmm. How many bartenders do you have in London? Millions. <laughs> But I wanted to be one of those that you, you will know his name, you will know what he's been doing, and you will know that, that he's passionate about, that he will make it. And so I you think, think my, that that one just day, it all clicked? Yes, one of the things that everything is matching, you know, probably uh-huh. someone missed the recipe, probably someone uh-huh. didn't turn up. Everything worked. Literally like, you know, and I did my best. So uh-huh. it was like a kind of mix of uh, luck and things. Uh-huh. So at that time, you know, then I can look at me and say, like, I'm really uh, proud and pleased to see that. And that was only eight months into... Yeah, it was eight idea. months, one, one year roughly. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it was like, I'm really pleased. You know, all my colleagues, they were there for probably two, three years and they've been competing, but none of them took the trophy home. Mm-hmm. So they were like, okay, <laughs> you know, this is really, really, really interesting. And then from there, I went to the final. I didn't make it through. Uh, I didn't win. Uh, I was the fifth 
out of uh, 10, but to go to the global farm for me opened up a new world, you know, like the bartending is a serious thing, you know, the cocktail and the surf and the way how you make feel people, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things that uh, I try to to implement it, you know, into the next competition and next and next. next. So then when I was at, at uh, Quovadis a certain day, then he called me up and he said, like, I need to give you a news. So I'm like, yes. So, you know, I'm leaving Kovadis. And I was like, okay, wow. He's <laughs> leaving Kovadis, this is a big thing. What are you doing? What, what, what are you doing? You know, I was like, my mentor is just yeah. telling me that he's leaving. What is he doing? So like, I'm going to India and I'm going to go to work for Bakari. I have some activities, you know. I won the UK legacy. They offered me a job and then, and then I could see the whole team after him, like, leaving. I was like, okay, fine. Uh, what is next? What I really wanted to do. What, what I want to do. I said, like, don't worry. I will give an advice in between everyone that is here. You are definitely has more potential to have my place, you know, like, so we, I think they wanted a really placed to have you on board as, you know, a bar manager for the place. I was supervisor in a way. I become, you know, like responsible for the closing, you know, in the meanwhile, they never pay me for it, but they let me do it. So the kind of usual uh, London style, you know, when they see someone that you really want to do it. But then at that stage, they're like, I think the owner, they will be happy to, to have you. So I remember that the owner said to me, ah, you know, you look young, you're good, maybe as assistant, maybe she'll give you some, someone next to you. I said, whatever, whatever you decide to do, for me, it's fine because of, it's a learning process. Mm -hmm. But I can, I'm confident in what I'm doing. And I was really confident with the guest. It's a member's club. Remember, you need to know the name of the people. You need to know what they represent. You need to know what they're eating. You need to know everything. So then after that, they call a guy in. And uh, luckily, you know, it wasn't so, so, so great, luckily for me. And uh, after one week or two weeks, they sent him out and uh, they, they, they said to me, you are the bar manager, we want only you. Sorry if we thought that you couldn't be enough, but you can understand you are 22, 23, and you're really young. No, yeah, 23, mm -hmm. 23 or something. You're really young and, you know, we, we really want you. I was like, it's fine. They want to look at me and say, the only thing you need to promise me, they need to grow your beard. I was like, okay. To grow your beard? <laughs> yeah, I was like, why? I said, like, because you so look you too young. There? You said, you look too young and you are untrustable. Please grow, grow your beard right now. I was like, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this was the package that I had to take. So I grow my beard. Since then, I have my beard. <laughs> and then I was the, the, the bar manager of Kovadis. Then Kovadis changed. Jeremy Lee came on board, so Philippe, which was the French chef, left, which was incredible chef. Jeremy as well, incredible chef. I've been working close with him, understand the seasonality, really seasonal British, um, uh, you know, food. That's what he used for his dishes. And uh, I fall in love with his kitchen, with him as a person, a character. He's been doing a lot of activities in uh, BCB, presentation, the best British uh, chef, food, food chef, I can't remember the title of the, of the show. It was one of the judges, one of the mentors. So it was something like really big. And I was like, this is a good place where to be that you can open up, you know, your connection. Uh, in the meanwhile, at the club, we had Daniel Craig coming for a martini, you know, or Jude Law coming for a vodka, lime and soda. Uh, you know, so we have a really high members mm -hmm. <laughs> club. Um, orientated of actresses or actors and stuff so quite cool loved it been there for uh, probably I don't know, remember three years maybe three years and something uh, loved it a lot and at a certain point a friend of mine came in as well it's always someone came in you know like <laughs> and said I have a better job for you no I came in and uh, he ask me something is uh, are you happy here because i got something for you is my friend is the operational director of a big group and you know he's looking for a bar manager i was like okay let me have a look you know like why not it's three years now three years three and a half we did a lot of things why not it's good good to change mm -hmm. i remember the words of a good friend of mine which is called mark plumbridge uh, he says in a place you work three years the first you settle in the second you prove yourself and the third you you think how to make a move so I was like I was thinking about those words at that time and uh, <laughs> and then uh, this friend of mine got me in touch with um, with the operational director for aqua group and uh, we decided just to to talk he offered me a position as a, a bars manager for the aqua Argyle street which has two venues 
One is the Japanese and the other one is the uh, Spanish. So you have two bars plus the bars outside. So three, four re revenue center, big venue, like during the summer, during the winter, a little bit quieter, but a really uh, good place where, where to learn a different type of, you know, managing. You know, I had 22 people there. Mm -hmm. So then I took the, the challenge on board and uh, I brought with me my assistant, which he became assistant. He was a simple bartender at Covadis, but he became my assistant. I took it over with me. We made a massive change from the glassware. So we implement what it was a cocktail culture into a place where it was completely lost. Mm -hmm. The numbers and the money was the most important things. The rest, it didn't count much. Uh, unfortunately, it's like that, the culture. Uh, so then I spent a year over there, I think, or a year and a half. Then they sent me to Hong Kong for 15 days, 18 days to overview some bars. So I had an opportunity to see the bars of the company overseas, which it was great. Then after that, I came back and they said to me, well, now it's time for you. We, we did a new opening of a bar in the meanwhile. So at Nueva, so the Spanish side, we, I redesigned a bar. So I started to get into a projecting, you know, like something that I never done before, projecting a bar from scratch. Like you have a piece of paper, you know what to do, how to do it. And uh, uh, we launched a bar. Uh, with the terrace, it was successful. New opening of a new restaurant, fantastic. And now the boss said to me, your time is gone. Now you need to make a move. We need you at the chart. I was like, okay, you need me in the chart. Okay, I said, uh, we, we discussed, you know, for a few months. I told him no first. I said, no, I want to be here. Then he got a bit nervous about it. Like, you know, for a month he didn't speak to me. And then he came back again. Uh, now we need you, la, la, la. Don't be so full of yourself, the usual words to make you make, make a step. Uh -huh. I said, no, I'm not making that. It's just, I'm making this because I pretend, <laughs> I'm not asking, <laughs> I pretend more money that you propose me. So then it was like, okay, you trying to be like that. Like, you know, he's a, he's a person with a different thing is really personal. In the end, they give me what I asked. So it was fine. <laughs> so I won. And uh, then uh, I moved over there. I can say that it wasn't easy because they've been without a bar manager for like six months, eight months. So you can imagine the disaster in there. There was not a reference. There was an assistant that didn't care. Uh, great person, uh, but obviously different. So we had a few troubles here and there, but in the end we move. I mean, we move forward and spend another two, three years, I think. Did you ever think, oh, it's a good thing I did three months? or of accounting and economics at university because now I've got that. <laughs> that's for sure, that's for sure. I tell you one thing that my, my teacher, he told us, you imagine the classroom at the university you've probably been, you've probably been studying. Uh, I did not study by being there. This classroom, we were probably 300 of us. And he started to understand which are the group of people, you know, in the first three months, he understand, he doesn't care. And he said to us, I will make you just one question and I will give you as well the answer. Okay. Why you are here today? Like it was economics. He was talking about, you know, the way he had like two companies. And in the meanwhile, on his spare time, he was coming there to teach us how to make business. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that to us. And I, I put my hands up and I, and I said, I'm here because, you know, I want to learn as much as I can, uh, you know, in regards and I want to do my own business. And he looked at me and said, okay, what, what is your name? He said, my name, my name is Luke. And he said, well, I can tell you this, that if you really and you truly are a businessman, you don't need to be sitting here to listen to what I'm telling you. You can do it without me. So there is no point for you to sit in there and listen to me. You can make your own business without doing this. You know, this is just a little help. You know, like, and this is for everyone. So everyone look at around. I look at myself it's like, this guy is telling me that what I'm spending, what I'm doing is not right. This guy is mad, but probably is so right <laughs> because I asked him, well, you're telling me this. And I said to him, and then you've been studying. And he said to me, well, I had to study to teach in a university, but the first successful business that I had, I never studied for it. So how you're going to put it down is up to you, you know. Hopefully you went back to your dad and told him the story. And then he <laughs> gave you... <laughs> Probably I will do that. But I was like, okay. Well, so, let's talk Italicus. Hey, right? Yes, 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 yes. Let's talk Italicus. So you finish with the shard or whatever. <laughs> about however to. About to, about to. 
But so tell us about how you got involved with Italica. So uh, Giuseppe Gallo has been uh, one of those extremely talented people. I'm not considering him as a bartender or a manager or a director, person, people, you know, that's what I'm considering him, to see a vision and make it happen. Um, so I remember back in time, he launched a product that he was called Italicus. Uh, it was the beginning of September. We didn't know what it was. And I've seen it. I was like, whoa, you know, like this is a big boom. The bottle looks fantastic. You know, the video of the thing, it was incredible. I knew that he was about to do something. I've been working with him when he was in Martini. So he was calling me up to do events with him. I would be pleased to do it. Whatever he will say, I, w I will support him because he's a really cool uh, person, you know, like to, to stay around with. Then uh, it comes to a point that we had a chat. And he said to me, like, you know, I talked to Giuseppe. He says to me, yeah, you know, look, uh, but would you, would you be interested in making a move? I said, like, at the moment, I'm fine where I am. You know, like, you know, my, you know, I got to pay this and that, you know, but I'm really passionate about. So, like, I can tell you, that's what he said to me. He said, these words, he said, I can tell you for sure, I can afford you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure about it, but stay with me and soon I, I will come back to you. I was like, don't worry, Giuseppe, it's not, it's not about money, you know, you know, I like to stay next to you, whatever you, you want me to help with, I'm really pleased and I do it with passion and love, so don't worry. So then we left ourselves like that. In the meanwhile, we've been speaking with, for other uh, activation that we were doing. Uh, then we were speaking at uh, London Cocktail Week. He came to me and said, look, I need to talk to you. I was like, okay, so, you know, I need to tell you this. And I said, what do you need to tell? No, we need to speak because, you know, like um, right now uh, for, from January, I will look up for, uh, for a global brand ambassador. And I was thinking you will be the right person to represent the brand. And I look at me like, I look at him like that. I was like, okay, that is, seems to be like interesting, you know, like the, the, the feeling of it. I said, okay, let's have a proper sit down. I'll come to see you. Let's talk through everything and then let's see what, what we can make it together he said to me explain the concept explain what it is you know it's a startup company it's three people i know everyone you know i, I knew everyone every everyone from italicus since before and um, we had this chat and we said you know what i will be pleased to be on board i'll start on the 2nd of january or the 3rd i don't remember and uh, that's how we start did you know anything about Rosalio? Uh, well, I knew what it was Rosalio because my family used to produce it. But this is a different type of thing. So when we speak about Rosalio, we need to really clear. You know, my grandmother used to make a Rosalio with roses, for example. Is it, this something that like every grandmother makes? Uh, well, they used to make it, mm -hmm. but I got lost in the tradition. Because Rosalio is just a simple, medieval, you know, like a really ancient is a really, how can I describe it? Rosolio is a really ancient type of liquor because it's made with any kind of spice that will grow close to your house. Like something that you could find to the local field from the north of Italy to the south of Italy. Obviously, the spice that you will find will be completely different from the north to the south. So they were harvesting whatever it was growing, infuse it with alcohol and add sugar. This is a Rosolio. Rosolio, the word, is coming from the Latin word Ros Olis, which means morning dew. In Italiano, in Italian, goccia di rugiada. So why is that? Because when they were harvesting the spice, they will go early in the morning. And what they could find early in the morning, the little, you know, a condensation, do, yeah. you know, on the top of the spice. So that's his name, Rosolio. So Rosolio doesn't mean that it's made out of roses. Roses can be one of the um, botanicas which is implemented into the rosolio but it's not because of that that it's called rosolio now did your grandmother make with rose what did she make she with? was making with the uh, dried roses mm -hmm. I, I have no idea why or whatever probably it was the, the spice that she could find you know like mm -hmm. we go to herboristeria which I have no idea how to call it in English I don't but uh, it's a place where you find herbs roots uh, that they, they were helping, you know, digestion, you know, everything is natural. She would go there, buy some flowers, pour into alcohol, leave it there for probably a month, and then add the sugar afterwards. That's his rosolio. And what are the, the most famous ones? Well, so there's roses. Uh, well, what the, others? Well, when we speak about Italicus, yeah. is the most Italicus uh, rosolio di Bergamotto is the only 
Rosolio, which he has, is distributed in 24 countries worldwide, is the global Rosolio, you know, like mm. as a global print. Uh, other Rosolio right now in Italy is... No, I meant, I meant originally, like grandmothers would make. Ah, as grandmother will make, for example, close to my house, uh, uh -huh. probably they will uh, utilize lavender. That is what's, what, so really, what grows. So really, you know, yes. flowers and herbs Anything, and spices. Anything, gentian, uh -huh. they were using, which is a, which is a root. Mm -hmm. Like licorice. Imagine mm -hmm. licorice is like really popular in the mm -hmm. Italian tradition. Do they use it, do it with fruit as well? Sure. Oh, so it's pretty much anything thrown into a bottle with alcohol. Yes. Sitting yes. forever. Yes. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, doing that kind of thing. But always like they will play with different things. Like, so if you use roses, you will put probably a bit of lavender. She will put roses, lavender. And then she will put probably the skin of the lemon. Did you like it when you were little? Uh, well, I probably tasted, but it was really uh, mellow. You know, uh -huh. like, uh, you know, my, my, my grandfather really liked it. He was uh -huh. drinking it quite a lot. And she used to use honey instead of sugar. Uh -huh. Because she loved the honey taste, you know. Uh, so in my family, from one side to another, my grandmother from my dad's side and my grandmother from my mom's side, they are both similar like they cook in different dishes they are doing different liquors but both of them together in the way if you look them they're doing the same thing are they both from northern italy no one from the south and one from the north oh, so, that's why i'm oh. saying they have different culture lucky you yeah You've i'm a mix northern, of everything I'm northern a mix of everything. and southern <laughs> specialties every time you want to visit a grandmother yeah i have different food for lunch <laughs> right exactly <laughs> so when did italica start making the rosario again So, I keep saying it wrong, I'm sorry, Rosolio again. Yeah. Rosolio di Bergamotto, yes. Italicus, mm. uh, starts, we can say 2015, when the idea and all the things starts along. The first launch of Italicus, Rosolio di Bergamotto, began in September at the Bafur Bar at the Savoy Hotel, where Giuseppe introduced to the world what is Rosolio, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, introduced what is a Rosolio di Bergamotto. So that it was a kind of big push. Yes, especially because bergamot isn't known really throughout the world. It's not like an orange or a lemon. It's very specific. I mean, I know it because bergamot I, is I've a, had it in Cyprus, but exactly by something uh, so specific. Bergamot is a the unique, most authentic fruit, which has come from a simple and single origin of Italy, which is Calabria, and. The way how it grows is a DOC, so it's a controlled origin, mm -hmm. okay? The aromas and the production of bergamot, we don't know much about it because it gets used simply for perfume, you know? Mm -hmm. Like they utilize in the oil, they implement in, in perfume. The reason is because bergamot has 386 different matching and is the only aromas or the only oil that he has so many matching if you look up on for lemon probably has 20 30 you know but you know bergamot has 380 so that it makes a massive difference when you put into a perfume so most of the perfume like aqua di parma or whatever they have bergamot, bergamot. Uh -huh. into it but bergamot is so common using perfume but so uncommon in like use it the pulp itself is really It's really tough, mm -hmm. you know, it's really uh, acid, acid, you know, like uh, has that kind of sense of really he acid citrus, you know. Uh, so the skin is the richest part. Ourselves, we're using uh, Calabrian bergamot and uh, the production of Rosolio is not just with bergamot, you know. Uh, Italicus, Rosolio di Bergamotto is made out of different spice and inspired by a recipe. This recipe is coming from uh, from Turin, from the Rosolio di Torino, which was one of the most uh, common um, Rosolio that it was popular uh, in the 1600s, 1700s. So we decided to take that, okay, as a base, as a root. So going back to the origin of what it is, and then we add uh, naturally and we implemented the oil of bergamot. So this is it. This is what is Italicus. And then alongside with uh, cane sugar. You've kind of unified Italy with this. You took something from the north exactly. and you took something from the south. Exactly. To make a, a totally Italian product. <laughs> exactly what it is. is a journey from the north of Italy mm -hmm. going to the south. That, this is it. This is what it is. Then we have a little touch of um, um, 
uh, Cedro as well, which is coming from Sicily. Ah. The reason why we implement it because it's the connection in between what is the, the, the first stage, so infusing you know, the alcohol uh, with you know, the botanicals, and then the oil, which is naturally extracted into water. So it's like the conjunction of the two flavor-wise. So what is the best way to drink this? I, I'm sure you're going to say any way, but it, do you envision it as something that someone sips after dinner? Sure. As well as well, having it in cocktails? Obviously. Italicus is a reborn aperitivo because as is reborn rosolio with Italicus, uh -huh. you know, we believe that as a reborn aperitivo. For us, the best way to drink it on the rocks with, uh, you know, cold, chilled is, is the best way as a uh, open up the palate, but also, okay, uh, with uh, sparkling wine or Prosecco or champagne or anything which uh, it can help to uh, brings up, you know, uh, to the palate, the flavor wise of what is Italicus, you know, mm -hmm. and the sparkling wine, it works so well. It sounds so good. Uh, we should have one. Should we go have one? Let's have one. Oh, I can't yeah. wait. I loved sitting down with Luca. He is a storyteller extraordinaire. Look for Italicus. You can't miss its gorgeous blue-green bottle. Remember, you can always find it in my shop at www.alushlifemanual.com backslash shop. You'll need it for one of our easiest cocktails of the week. There is no excuse not to make this one. It's perfect for the autumn ahead. So here it is, our cocktail of the week. This week the cocktail is the Apalicus, a mashup between India Pale Ale, otherwise known as IPA, and Italicus. You take a chilled beer glass and start with 30 ml of Italicus. Then slowly add in 300 ml of IPA beer. That's it. It's a great combination for a hearty low ABV aperitivo cocktail. You'll find this recipe and all the cocktails of the week on alushlifemanual.com where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. Next week, we visit with Stephanie Jordan of Drinking Out Loud. We first sat down to chat when she was brand ambassador of La Chachera Rum. She still works with them, but now runs her own company and what a story she has. Before I leave you, don't forget to vote for Lush Life for Saveur Magazine's Best Drink Blog Award by heading to alushlifemanual.com and clicking the button. Thank you. Until next time, bottoms up. Thanks for listening to the Lush Life Podcast, the sister of A Lush Life Manual. For more information and links to everything you heard, plus a bit more, please visit alushlifemanual.com. Always remember the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly. Okay, I said that last part. Theme music is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. Lush Life is produced by Evo Terra. And I'm your hostess, Susan Schwartz. I'll see you at the bar.